Thank you, Lord. Can we just lift a hand up to heaven right now? Let's just give him some praise. Thank you, Jesus. God, we give you worship. God, we lift your name on high. Thank you, Lord. You are worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our praise, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we get to experience you on earth, Lord. Thank you, God, that you're a close God. You're a close God, so we just worship you, God. We give you praise in this place today. Thank you, Lord. And we got a brother that wants to share something here. So. Hey, church. Um, wow, just so, so blessed to be with so many believers who just love God so much. And I just, I don't know, I got this revelation a while back that the Holy Spirit said, I gave up everything <laughs> for you. Like, and I'm sure you've heard it, but if you're the only person that accepted Jesus, he still would have came and died for you. It's a personal God we serve. He's not some far off distant working in some other galaxy, like, ooh, this is a cool project I got here. You know, just he's paying attention to us. We got the ear of the creator, like he's just listening, waiting for us to ask him. What, where should I go, God? Send me, I'll, I'll do it. I don't know what that means, but I'm gonna go, because I love you. Yeah. He just gave up everything. God, God gave up everything to get you back. The ransom price on your life is the blood of Jesus, and he paid it without a second thought. It said before the creation of the world, before the foundations were laid, Christ was crucified. He decided that before he created everything. He's like, you are so valuable. I'm going to go through all this for you. That's our God. Amen. 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 You know, something in the room that I was feeling during worship was that there's a few, there was, um, this is the thought I had. There's things that people feel they're carrying in the room today, and they're directly attached to our old man. Shame, that's attached to your old person. That's in the grave. When you were, when you became born again, you were risen to new life. But a lot of times we go back to the grave and we begin to raise the old man. But if you will put down... Hear me out. If you will put down the old man, those things that you're carrying, they go to the grave too. God does not want you to carry shame. All these things that weigh us down, they are attached directly to our old man. Those are dead. Sometimes we have to see it that way. So Lord, thank you for bringing us back to life, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that those shame guilt, pain. God, that those things are attached to the old man that you killed. So today, God, we just decide to crucify the old man. We thank you, Lord, that we can see ourselves like new people, new creations in Christ Jesus. And for that, God, we say thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done in our life. Can you offer him a sacrifice of praise today? God, we sacrifice our thanksgiving to you, Lord, today. Thank you, God, for what you did for us, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you did what no one else could do. You brought us to life, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And Thanksgiving is one of those simple little things we can do on a daily basis. You can either complain and activate the old man, or you can think, thank God and activate the new man. It's just an easy thing to do. Lord, I don't feel it. I feel all this negative stuff, but I'm going to thank you today because I know that you've done it. The old man's dead, and I'm living in the new man. So Thanksgiving is one of those simple little things we can do. Amen? Hey, why don't you turn to somebody and say, I'm thankful. Can you do that? I'm thankful. Well, welcome, everybody. Man, thanks so much for coming out to church today. The service is a whole lot better because you're here 
Boy, for you folks that's watching online, too, the same goes for you. Uh, I mean, if you're joining us online while you're part of Destiny family, we really appreciate you joining us, and, and this service is better because you're here. And, and boy, you folks online, if you ever get up in our area, please stop in. We'd love to meet you face to face. I always say this, these are the best people in Minnesota right here in this building. And so everyone would love to meet you guys online. Boy, it's my privilege to receive God's tithes and our offerings this morning. Um, uh, we got some ushers around. They got envelopes. If you're given, uh, if, if you're given cash today and like a tax receipt, just lift up your hand. They'll get you an envelope. Man, you know it's it, it, it's such a privilege to tithe. That's when uh, you give the first uh, ten percent of your income to God because that's a tangible way of getting in partnership with God. And you know you might say, well. Man, I can't. I got too many bills to do that. Well, hey, when you get in partnership with God, why well, your bills become God's bills, yeah. and boy, that that's a whole different way of living. It's so much more peaceful and better. Uh, and man, when you, when we tithe, we're in partnership with God, and He promises that all of heaven's resources are available to us. You, you, you know, when we give offerings, that's anything above our tithe. And, and man, Jesus promises. He, he said, surely I'll see to it that you get back at least 100 times as much. So, I, I mean, this is, a, this is an investment. This is a seed we're sowing. So, man, let's take our tithes and offerings in hand right now. And um, you want to agree with me in prayer? Man, Father God, we're, we're tithing here uh, as your sons and daughters, get, getting in partnership with you. Man, I thank you, God. We're not living life on our own now. We're tithers. We're living life in partnership with you. Our bills become your bills. Thank you for that, God. And for everyone that's given an offering, man, we put our faith in agreement with them. They're sowing a seed. And you promise they get back at least 100 times as much as what they're sowing. We thank you for that harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, ushers, you can serve the people here. Um, uh, making out checks. It's Destiny Church. Um, Man, our mailing address is up there. If you're online, you, you can even text to give. Very convenient uh, uh, that way. Um, and I, and I, I got a few announcements here today. Um, Wednesday, January 25th, this next Wednesday, uh, we're moving on with our core nights. We're talking about, uh, about finishing strong. These Wednesday nights have been a lot of fun. Man, last Wednesday we had some of the best chili you've ever eaten. Uh, so that's just a benefit. <laughs> Well, so Wednesday night at 6.30 here at the church for adults and for children. We have an exciting children's curriculum. And, uh, and for teenagers, they're over at the fitness center. Uh, that's also at 6.30 on Wednesday night. And we got a men's breakfast this next Saturday, February 4th. Uh, hey, at 6 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> Boy, if you get up at 6 a.m. and you get here by then, you deserve a good breakfast. And that's what we're having, pancakes and bacon and eggs and uh, all the stuff that goes with that. Well, that's, uh, that's always a good time, the men's b breakfast. That's this Saturday, February 4th. And man, we got um, the, the IF gathering for ladies uh, is coming up, and, and we're hosting it here on March 3rd and 4th. You know, that's, a, that's an international meeting, but in our area, why it's going to be here. And so, uh, so get your tickets from Linda. Uh, you can talk to her about those. Uh, that's March 3rd and 4th, Friday and Saturday. Okay, uh, and you, just as always, um, if, you, if you got any questions about the church, or especially this time of year, boy, we love to get your, your phone number or, and your email or your email, because if we run into a snowstorm or something why, and we're canceling, then we got a way to get a hold of everybody. So, so I'd love to get your information. And then uh, questions then also, if you've got any ideas about something we can do better here, we'd love to hear those too because we're always trying to improve. So, man, we've got a great message ahead of us from Pastor Steve. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> Thank you for that golf applause. <laughs> Hallelujah. I've got to get a new uh, line, but... Oh, it's good to have you all here, and um, I know it's cold outside, but just stick around. Tomorrow's going to be colder. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. You always say, uh, you can always say, well, it's bad, but it can always get worse. So anyways, but, uh, but then it's going to warm up because it won't last forever, will it? This too will pass. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open them with me to John chapter 16. 
I titled this message, The Holy Spirit, Our Greatest Helper. The Holy Spirit, Our Greatest Helper. And um, I want to talk about the help that the Holy Spirit brings to us and brings to our lives. And, um, you know, Jesus made an incredible statement in John 16, verse 7. He said, but, there's, but here's the truth. This is the Passion Translation. It's to your advantage, to your advantage, to your advantage that I go away. For if I go not away, the divine encourager will not be released to you. But after I depart, I will send him to you. The divine encourager is another word for the Holy Spirit. It's another phrase for the Holy Spirit. He says, it's to your advantage. Now just stop and think about that statement for a minute. He said, it's to your advantage. That means that you're better off, you're better off if I go away. Well, one thing that when he went away, of course, he, he provided for us redemption, but he, but he didn't mention that part of it. He mentioned the part about the Holy Spirit coming. To your advantage, I go away. If I go, don't go away, the Holy Spirit will not come, or the divine encourager. But if I go, I'll send him to you. And so, and he says, you'll be better off. So, you know, I always think about it. If I lived in the time of Christ, I would think, man, this would be awesome. Wouldn't you agree with me? I'd be following this guy everywhere. You know, walking on water, uh, seeing the miracles, lepers cleansed, uh, physical healings. I, I, I would be on his case. You know, I'd follow him like, what, I was going to say something, but I better not say it that way. But anyways, I, I would follow him. And, um, but, but here he says, it's to your advantage that I go away. And so we're, in his mind, we are going to be better off because the Holy Spirit is here. Amen. And so I don't think sometimes that we're always taking the full be benefit and drawing on the full benefit that the Holy Spirit has brought to our lives. And, you know, a lot of times people, uh, you know, when they think about the Holy Spirit, um, they just kind of think about it, something spooky or something like out there. But the Holy Spirit is a, a personal uh, agent that lives inside of us if you're a Christian. And every single person who is a Christian has the Holy Spirit in them. But, you know, it's interesting. I always tell this that uh, the Bible doesn't call receiving uh, salvation as receiving the Holy Spirit, even though there's a work of the Holy Spirit in salvation. But it's not really called receiving the Holy Spirit. Like when you look at the early church in the book of Acts, they didn't preach to people and ask them to receive the Holy Spirit. Like Philip went down to the city of Samaria. He didn't preach the Holy Spirit. He preached Christ. Because this is the, I always say it like this, Christ is God's gift to the sinner. Christ is God's gift to the sinner. The Holy Spirit is God's gift to his children. And so if you're a child of God, you're in a position to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and the Holy Spirit is a gift. Turn to your neighbor and say, gift. Yeah. Gift, you don't earn it or deserve it. You know, I grew up in a, a full gospel church, even though I wasn't a Christian until I was 17 years old. But I, I grew up in a full gospel church, Souls Harbor in Minneapolis. And um, I... Um, I, um, uh, you know, I was kind of like, um, you know, didn't really follow the church and, and its teachings. I was kind of like the bad guy, you know, the, you know, the, the bratty kid. You know, that, that's who I was. I was the bratty kid. And, um, and what happened to me was on New Year's Eve night, 1970, it was actually 1970, to, going into 71, I, was, I came to church because our service our church had a New Year's Eve service, and uh, we, they stayed up till after midnight, prayed in the New Year's, worshiped in the New Year. So I, I was at the church, and I went there because I had some other friends that, were, that went to church that were kind of like me. We weren't that interested in church. And so when I got there, this one good friend that I had, um, we used to, you know, we used to skip church and smoke and and rob places and while during during church i mean it was really it was bad it was bad i was it was a bad deal but anyways so i get there and all of a sudden i look at him and he's got a bible and he's got it stuffed in his pants and it's sticking out and i'm going i'm looking at him going what are you doing what, you know, 
what are you doing with the Bible? He goes, oh, I'm a Christian now. You're a Christian now? Are you kidding me? I was, I was just like, what are you talking about? We don't, we don't do that. We do the other stuff, you know. And so um, I just kind of ignored him and tried to find some other friends that would do the other stuff. And, um, and so later he came up to me. He said, hey, we're going to go to a party. And I'm going to, I got some friends that I want to witness to. Would you like to come with? And I thought, party? Yeah, that sounds good. So we, we took off for this party. He, he had a Firebird uh, car. And um, so we're with him and another guy, it was another friend of mine, and me. And we were going to drop this girl off. And on the way to dropping this girl off, we, we got a flat tire. And uh, so what do you do when you get a flat tire? Well, you change it, but he didn't have a spare. So what he did was he prayed for the tire. Because that's what you do, right? When you get a flat tire, you guys all do that, right? You can get out there and pray for the tire. But they were young Christians. They were very zealous, so they, pray, they were praying for the tire. Well, the tire didn't inflate. And so we ended up, like, right before midnight on New Year's Eve night, hitchhiking down University Avenue in Minneapolis. Some guy picks us up. He's, the cops are after him. He tells us he's wanted, and the cops are after him. So my two friends, they start talking to him about Jesus. And I couldn't believe what was going on here. I'm thinking, you know, I was uncomfortable because I wasn't a Jesus follower, and I was kind of uncomfortable, and they were telling them about Jesus. And um, so finally, but here's what happened to me. It's like, as they were talking to this guy about Jesus, Jesus was talking to me. And it's so hard to describe because if you never had the experience, it's hard to describe the experience. But, I mean, it was like God had put a spotlight on my life as I sat there in the back seat of that car, and they were telling this guy about Jesus. And that night I prayed and received Christ into my life. And I, I mean, I was, I mean, I have never been the same since that day, since that hour. And, um, and so Christ came in to live in my life. That was New Year's Eve night, 1971, well, 1970, 71. But three months later, I was, our church would always have prayer meetings and um, three months later, I was prayed for in a prayer meeting and um, almost against my will because I wasn't really in favor of it, but I was prayed for. And I mean, I was overcome by the, by the Spirit and I was filled with the Holy Spirit and received the gift of the Spirit. On New Year's Eve night, I received the gift of Christ, salvation. Three months later, I received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And see, that gift is of the Holy Spirit is for every Christian. If you're not a Christian here, then what you need to do is you need to receive Christ into your life because Christ is God's gift to the sinner. But if you're a Christian here and never received the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit is God's gift to his children. And so this working of the Holy Spirit, every single person, we need to have this experience of being filled with the Spirit. And the evidence of it is speaking in other tongues. And, uh, you know, the Bible says that if you look through the book of Acts, you'll see it's very clear when they would preach to sinners, they would preach Christ. Philip preached Christ because Christ is God's gift to the sinner. But when they found believers like Paul did at Ephesians, in Ephesians, he found believers. He preached the Holy Spirit to them. Did he, he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said we hadn't heard that there was a Holy Spirit, a, a gift of the Holy Spirit. And so he went on to pray for them. That they might be, and they, it says they were filled with the Spirit, spoke with tongues, and prophesied. And so it's, it's God's gift of the Holy Spirit is for every single Christian. Amen. So I just wanted, that wasn't my sermon, but that's his little introduction. So, but God wants us all to come to know the Holy Spirit and work with Him. Because the Holy Spirit is the, the third part of the Godhead that's in the earth today the third part of the Godhead that's in the earth today. In John chapter 14, verse 26, here Jesus talks about the comforter. This is the amplified version. The Bible says the comforter. And then the amplified gives six other words, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, standby, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, in my place to represent me and act on my behalf he will teach you all things and he will cause you to recall, will remind you of, bring to your remembrance everything I have taught you. 
And so the Holy Spirit is our greatest helper in every area of our life. The Holy Spirit is the greatest financier. The Holy Spirit is the greatest doctor. The Holy Spirit is the greatest parent. Amen. I mean, we raised five kids, and none of them are crazy. Some are borderline, but don't want to mention any names, but, um, but they're, none of them are crazy. They're all Christians. They're all serving God. They're all spirit-filled. They all have a heart for God. But I can't tell you how many times when I was faced with a situation, I said, Holy Spirit, what do I do in this situation? And I just waited, and the Holy Spirit all of a sudden prompted me to do something. Because the Holy Spirit is the greatest parent. He is the greatest boss. He's the greatest father. He's the greatest husband. Amen. The Holy Spirit will prompt you to go out and start your car, wife's car every morning. <laughs> Warm it up for her. Because the Holy Spirit is the greatest husband. Amen. He'll tell you what to do. But more than that, he'll show you things to come. Amen. I want you to look at a, a, a ministry of the Holy Spirit in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I don't know if this is going to come out great, but I actually felt led of the Lord to teach on this this morning. So, and I usually don't feel this strong to teach on something, but I felt really strong to teach on this. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 3 and 4, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any tribulation or trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So here the word calls, the Bible here calls God the God of all comfort who comforts us. The word comfort is the Greek word, it's a derivative of the word for the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. It's the same word. Jesus said, I'll send you another comforter. And it's the same word. Basically, he's talking here, when he talks about comfort, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the great comforter. What's interesting about this is that seven times in five verses, Paul uses the word comfort. Amen. He uses the word comfort seven times in five verses. And he talks about how that, the Holy, how that God brought comfort to his life when he was going through a very difficult time. And so I, I looked up that word comfort, uh, comforter, or comfort, and there's three meanings of the word that I want to talk about here this morning. There's three kind of tenses of what the word means. The first one is the soothing of pa the pain in, the, in a heart. Like, like you, you go through things and you're you're heartbroken and you're, you're, you're uh, devastated. I, I don't know how, how else you want to say it. There's loss, there's difficulties in your life, and you're hurting really bad. And the Holy Spirit is a soother of the pain. He's a, he's a mender of the broken hearts. He's, the, he's a, the balm of Gilead, you could call it. He, he puts a, a, something on your owie. Um, your heart owie, okay? And so that's, that's a legitimate ministry of the Holy Spirit. If you've, ever, if you've ever been in that situation and experienced the Holy Spirit healing work, I mean, not just that you went through it, but you actually felt the Holy Spirit's healing work, that's what Paul was talking about here, that he was going through difficulties, he was having trouble, he was being pressured to the point where he didn't think that he would survive, but he said, I had the... I had the Holy Spirit's comfort comforting me. So that's the first word, de description of this word. The second word, description of the word comforter, is a call or an exhortation in urging a earnest uh, admonition by someone close to you who stands with you. It's a summons or an entreaty. It's, it's, it's like a calling forth of somebody who is struggling that is faltering it's like somebody close to you like you're running a race or something and somebody and you're faltering you're you're not you're not going to make it or you're not going to continue on and somebody starts calling out to you like in my case to be Steve come on don't quit keep going lift those legs come on suck it up 
You can make it. Keep going. Don't stop. And so that's the sense of the word. Uh, comfort is an exhortation. Amen. You know, there, there's a lot of places in the Bible where, uh, where it talks about God bringing this kind of comfort and other people bringing this kind of comfort to our lives. You know, the Apostle Paul, many times in his life, he encountered difficulty. In fact, if you read the, in 2 Corinthians there, chapter 1, he talked about at being at the point of death many times. And we read through Acts, you find that's true, that he was at the point of death many times. Um, one time he was snake bit. I mean, if you look at this toward the end of Acts, chap, starting in chapter 20. He goes to Jerusalem. He's mobbed in Jerusalem and they try to kill him. And the Roman soldiers break the mob up and they get Paul away before they actually kill him. I mean, so he's, he's almost killed there. Then the Jews band together, 40 Jews band together that they're not going to eat until they kill Paul. And so there again, his life is being threatened again. And so then he's, he's shipped to another city. And then uh, eventually he's, uh, he's on a ship to, to Rome and he's, and he's shipwrecked on the ship. So he's almost killed again. He lands on an island and then he, as he's building a fire, a snake comes out and bites his arm. And so he's almost killed again. I mean, I mean, are you kidding me? If I was Paul, I'd be going like, come on, what is going on? But he talks about, in all of these situations, he talks about how God encouraged him. How God encouraged him. How sometimes it was that God sent an angel and the angel stood by him and encouraged him. Uh, like, for, for example, when he was shipwrecked, it says that... In, now, think about this, that for 14 days they were in this storm at sea. 14 days. And they, it says that they didn't see the sun for 14 days. And they're at, at, in a sea, and it was like a historic, sun, a historic storm. It was so windy, and they were being blown all over the place. They had to keep throwing stuff out of the ship to lighten the ship. They threw the tackle out of the ship. I don't even know what that was. Is it for fishing or something? I don't know. But um, they're throwing stuff to lighten the ship. And for four, just think, if you were in Paul's position right there, for 14 days, you're in this storm, you haven't seen the sun, and you're in this terrific windstorm, and you don't know what's going to happen. And so after 14 days, all of a sudden, an angel comes and says, says to Paul, you know, that everything's going to be okay as far as people's lives, but the ship's going to be totally demolished. And, um, and but you're, you're all going to end up on an island, and you're going to be okay. And so the angel came and encouraged him, brought comfort to him in that, in that storm. You know, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about storms because there's three storms in the Bible that are very well known. I'm talking about storms at sea. And the one storm, is, the first one that we, we think about is Jonah and the whale. That's a storm. And I, I find that these three storms, they're caused by three different things. Jonah and the whale, Jonah was the reason for the storm. How many know that's true? Because there was 120,000 people that were going to die if he didn't go preach to them. 120,000 people, that's a lot of people back in that day. There's 120,000 people that were going to die if Jonah didn't go preach to them. And so, but Jonah didn't want them to repent. I guess Jonah had such confidence in his preaching ability that he thought if he goes there, they'll repent. So I'm not going. Because that city, which was also part of a nation, were the, were the number one threat to his country. And so he didn't want to go, he didn't want them to repent. He wanted God to destroy them. And so it says that he, he fled from the presence of God. Now, you know, I thought to myself, why couldn't he just stay where he was and just say, I ain't going? But, it's, but what happened was, and this happens to us sometimes. Every, he was going to church or synagogue, and every time he showed up, the presence of God showed up. And when the presence of God showed up, God, the presence of God told him, you got to go to Nineveh. I don't want to go to Nineveh. So finally, it got so bad that he finally just took off. He left. And it says that he went down, and then he got to the ship, and he went down in the ship. His whole life is going down at that point. His whole life is going down, 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 down. Why? Because he's going the wrong way. Have you ever in your life been going the wrong way? He's going the wrong way. 
And so finally, God sends a storm to turn him around. So Jonah was the reason for the storm in, in that book. And he got turned around. He went to, back to Nineveh. And Nineveh repented. And they were saved. And Jonah was mad. But I guess I can understand why Jonah did it. But that was one storm in the Bible. The second storm is uh, Jesus and the disciples in the boat. And that storm was stri strictly demonic. Uh, that was caused by the devil because Jesus rebuked the storm and it was, there was a, a, a still. And so much of what Paul went through was also caused by a demonic attack. He said that there was given to me a messenger of Satan to buffet me, keep me from exalting him above measure. So that, that storm, so the first storm was Jonah was the cause. The second storm, the devil was the cause. But the third storm was the one that I just talked about, about Paul and, and what happened was he told those people, I don't think we should go ahead. I, I, I get the sense, this is what he said, I get the sense that if we go ahead, this ship's going to be in trouble. It could be, it, it could be loss of life. It could be loss of belongings. It could be loss of everything. I get, I don't think we should go ahead. But they said, no, we're not listening to you. We're going to go ahead anyways. And they got into the storm. And so the third storm was because of disobedience. And Paul got sucked into it because of their disobedience. And so you look at those three storms. And if you're going through a storm, you've got to ask yourself a question. What is the reason for this storm? It's either the devil. It's either the devil or it's. It's you're going the wrong way or it's somebody else's disobedience and you got sucked into it. How many can see what I'm saying? But what and, and here's the thing. Here's the other thing that people don't realize. You know, we we talk about God's best in a person's life. We talk about contending for God's best and that God has great things for us. And that's all true. But it, there is a degree of obedience that has to be in our lives to enjoy God's best. There's a degree of obedience that has to be in our lives to enjoy God's best. And sometimes when we're going through a situation and we're praying about the situation, what God does is he gives us the best results based on the circumstances. So what, in Paul's case, you know, 14 days in a storm, you know he's praying, right? I mean, he's, he's praying, he's asking God for what, you know, I'm, I'm sure he might even been rebuking the storm. I mean, he's praying, rebuking, he's probably doing a lot of things. And after 14 days, an angel comes and stands by him and says, in this situation, the best result is this, because disobedience brought this situation about. The best result that I can do is this, in this situation is I can cause there to be no loss of life, but the, storm, but the storm is going to take out the boat, is going to take out all the belongings. And so that's one thing that people don't understand, is that we think that we can, we can we're, as we're children of God, potentially God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, potentially because we're children of God. He has only good on, our, good on his mind on our behalf. But... There has to be a degree of obedience to experience God's best. You know, one of the things it says here about Paul, I don't know if this is, uh, if you guys are still with me. I know this is, uh, maybe, maybe it gets a little heavier, but I've had some experiences, you know, in prayer at times where I've had, um, I've had God to tell me, you know, I was praying for a situation or praying for a person, and I've had God to say to me, it would be better if you let this person go because under the circumstances, it's not going to be that good for the person. And, you know, at times, you know, you just want to go, that can't be right. But sometimes people, you know, because of the way they live and because of the way they, they choose to act is that they create storms that they, and then they want God to just take the storm away. And sometimes... Sometimes God can do that. Sometimes uh, I can tell you this, that sometimes uh, it's not going to be that great. And the thing that 
is the biggest problem is, is spiritual sins. Spiritual sins. We always look at the sins of the flesh, like, you know, sins of the flesh, but spiritual sins are greater sins. That's why, have you ever noticed this, when the Bible talks about prayer, several times when it talks about prayer, a prayer promise, like even in the Lord's Prayer, one of the things that it brings up is forgiveness. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those that trespass. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who trespass against us. And Christians, I tell you, Christians have attitudes about other people, and they hold unforgiveness, they hold resentment toward other people, and they have basically unforgiveness that is totally unacceptable. I mean, to God, He forgave us when we didn't really deserve it, nor we could get past it. And God said, I forgave you. And I expect you to forgive other people. And for unforgiveness is a spiritual sin. And if you, if you are in unforgiveness, you are sinning yourself into a storm. Let me just say that well, again. If you're into strife or if you're into unforgiveness, you are sinning, and I do say sinning, you are sinning your way into a storm. And you're going to, want God to take that storm away, but you were the reason the storm came into existence in the first place. How many can see what I'm saying? And so it's very important for us to be responsible. And here's the, here's the job of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will, will tell you, I mean, here, you know what I've done? I've had this happen to me many times because what I did is when I get into strife with people, I justify myself. I got a good mind. My wife said, you should have been a lawyer. I got a good mind. I, I can make a case for my, my actions that has, it's all my case when it's done, it's got it all wrapped up. It's got a beautiful bow tie. Bow, it's perfect. It's a wonderful case for why I acted the way I acted and why I don't need to go to them and I don't need to talk to them and they're blah, 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 blah. They don't deserve my, my speech and they don't deserve my humility and they don't, they don't deserve my forgiving them. How many of you ever felt that way? And I got this long list of why. But one, one thing about it is, you know, I've, I've, had, uh, I've had the Holy, when you, when you spend time with the Lord and you're meditating, it's like, it's like Jonah. He had to flee the presence of God because every time he got into the presence of God, there it is. That's why people don't like to go to church and worship is because they got stuff that they got to get rid of. They got people they got to forgive. They got restitution they have to make. But your storm could easily be self inflicted. You say, what is the source of this storm? It could, it could be, not guarantee that it is, but it could be self inflicted. It could be because of a spiritual sin, the spiritual sin of unforgiveness. And that's one of the biggest sins that the church commits. Because we, we, we think that we can carry little offenses toward people and it doesn't matter. But actually, those offenses add up and they, they move you in a certain direction. You're, it, it's moving you into a storm. I know you guys aren't going to be excited about this, but I'm really, really trying to help you. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. I'm trying to help you. Believe me, I'm trying to help you not sin your way into a storm. Because storms are the pits, as we used to say. And so this word, comfort, has with it the idea, carries with it the idea of encouragement, has uh, to people that are downhearted, or, or and, and it comes, that encouragement comes from the Lord himself. It can come through angelic visitations. I mean, sometimes uh, angels, you know, I know that sometimes people think that when you talk about angels, it's like, oh, what is this? Casper the friendly ghost? I mean, come on. But the Bible says in Hebrews that they had so many angelic encounters that they said, make sure that you entertain strangers. I mean, why would you say that? Make sure that you entertain strangers because some people have entertained angels unaware. You know, I tell this story when we, we were preaching in Japan one time and um, you guys take a little bit more. 
trying to help you, came out to this sermon, came out crossways, but <laughs> I stumbled to the point, you know, I'm just, but um, so we were in Japan, and we, and we went there a couple times, and the second time we went, it was kind of a, it was kind of a hard, serv hard service, it's kind of a long story, but after the last service, we were leaving the building, and I was, I was actually on my way to go get McDonald's hamburgers, because I was going to, soothe my soul with food. Yeah, I don't drink, so I, I eat. If you see me at McDonald's, you'll know I'm having a bad day. <laughs> There's Stevie, he's at McDonald's. He's having a bad day. <laughs> yeah, pray for me. But so we're coming out, and my, I'm walking with my wife, and this old lady, she looked kind of thumpy. She's Jap you know, Japanese, but she looked kind of thumpy. I won't describe, but she grabs my wife by the arm, and she goes, she, speak, she speaks English. Everybody spoke Japanese, but she spoke English, and she was Japanese. And she goes, and she was an older lady, and she said, we're so grateful that you come here. We pray here every week, or I can't remember how often she prayed. And we're walking out of the building, and she's thanking us for coming and how much it meant to her and all this stuff. And I'm just thinking, what? you know, I'm just kind of almost aggravated, you know, because the meeting didn't go that good. You know, like maybe, you know, like I, I've been in meetings and preached and it didn't go that good. I don't know. This is still this sermon is still in the hanging in the balance. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, we'll see if I can land it, you know, see how it goes when I land it. But anyways, but um, so I was, I was walking, we're walking out, and everybody speaks Japanese. Nobody speaks English. It's very frustrating. And, uh, and so we go to this, we, there's a taxi there, and she escorts us to this taxi, and we're with another group of people. And they, they're going to take the train. And why is she taking us to this taxi? I, I don't understand. So I thought, well, we'll just take the taxi to the train because it was raining. And so we get in the taxi cab, and... She speaks to the taxi cab driver, and she again thanks us, almost to the point where it, get, it was getting embarrassing how much she was thanking us for coming. And then she says something to the cab, cab driver in, in English. He takes off. So I'm going, do, do you know, I said to the cab driver, do you know where we're, where we're going? He goes, I go, do you know our where our hotel is? And, and they kept asking me in the back seat, what, are, what, do, do we know where we're going? I said, I keep asking him, but he doesn't, he doesn't answer. He's just driving, you know. And, and then we go past where the train depot is, and there's the rest of the, of the crew, and they're waving at us as we drive by. And we're, <laughs> we're waving. And we're like, what is going on here? And we, he's taking us somewhere. We don't even know where he's going. Finally, about 20 minutes later, he drives up to our hotel. So I go, how did you know where we were staying? So now this could, might not be, but we st got to think of that, that lady was an angel and she knew where we were staying because angels appear unaware. And he said, be careful to entertain strangers because some have entertained angels unaware. I know you're thinking, oh boy, that's way out there. I don't think it should, we should think it's way out there. Because the early church ex had angelic visitations, and they came to bring comfort. They came to bring uh, ministry to the church. And so uh, let, let me just go through this here real quickly here. And so Paul experienced several times, he experienced uh, encouragement or he experienced comfort. Look at, um, for example, Look at um, 1 Timothy chapter 4. He says that all people, or 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said everybody that was, uh, forsook him, but he said the Lord stood by me. Verse 14, I think it is. The Lord stood by me. Everyone forsook me, but the Lord stood by me. Here's another place where he got encouragement from uh, Titus. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6 and 7. He says, but God, who encourages the downhearted, encouraged us by the arrival of Titus. 
We are encouraged not only by his arrival, but also by the encouragement you gave him as he reported to us your longing, your mourning, your deep concern for me, so I rejoiced even more. The word encourage is, is the same Greek word that comforts. So here other people brought encouragement to Paul. So you have God bringing encouragement to Paul. You have an angel bringing encouragement to Paul. Then you have other people bringing encouragement. You know what I find by that? I find the idea that God wants you to be encouraged. God wants you to be encouraged. Because Paul experienced intense pressure because of circumstances that he was facing. At times it looked so intense, it looked like he wasn't going to survive. Many times death came to him to take him out, but he kept trusting God who raises the dead. Look at this one more verse here, and we'll bring it to a close. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, it says, Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Now let me, let me just, well, let's keep reading, go ahead. Who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us, still deliver us. So in other words, he said that God did deliver us, God is delivering us, and we trust that he will yet deliver us. Then he says, you also helping together in prayer for us, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the great gift granted to us through the many. So we help people through, our, through praying for them. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will cause you to feel what other people feel when you pray. We call it intercession. He'll, he'll warn you that somebody needs prayer and that your prayer will bring comfort to that person's life. And so uh, God doesn't want you to falter. God doesn't want you to fail. And so the Apostle Paul experienced, you know, near-death experiences. But that word death is an interesting word because it's used many different ways in the Bible. Of course, it's used for physical death, but it's also used for things that die. You know, relationships that die. It's, it's used for, um, for people that, they're, they're maybe Christians, but they're living their life as if they're dead. You know, the Bible says that a person who lives in pleasure is dead while they live. So they, they actually live their life like a dead person. They're, they're unresponsive to spiritual things. You know, there's a verse in Ephesians chapter 5 where it says, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. And he talks about two different types of people there. People that are sleeping and people that are dead. And uh, he's not talking about literally dead, but he's talking about people that are living like they're dead or dead in trespasses and sins. And, you know, there's a lot of similarity between a sleeping person and a dead person. How many know that is true? But there's a lot of differences, too. You know, I remember one time I was, when I first got saved, I used to witness on the streets a lot in Minneapolis. And I, I, walked, I walked around this corner, and I was walking down Nicollet Avenue in the mall there. And I saw this guy laying on this bench. And when I looked at him, I thought, he's dead. And I thought, am I ready to encounter a dead body? Because I hadn't seen a lot of dead bodies at that point. And so I kept walking closer to him. I was thinking, is he dead? Is he dead? Is he dead? He's not moving. Is he dead? I kept thinking that because he's laying there. And finally, when I got up to him, I could see that he was, he was breathing, so he wasn't dead. But at, at one point, and that's how we can live our lives. We can live our lives even though we're alive, we're alive in Christ, we can live our lives like a dead person, like someone who's dead in trespass and sin. We can, we can live our lives by the same standards that people in the world that don't know Jesus, we can live by the same standards. In fact, let me give you this in conclusion here. I think I said that already, but let me say it. So look, look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. Paul said that, In all of this, our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly towards you. So he said the testimony of our conscience. 
So in other words, he said, if you put my conscience on the witness stand, it would testify and it would say this. It would say that we've lived our, conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom. So let me ask you a question. If we put your conscience on the witness stand and we said to your conscience, Swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. How are you living your life? Are you sinning your way into a storm? Or are you living in a good conscience before God? That's a, that's a really good point. Because what happens is, if your conscience is bothering you, let's all stand together. I don't know, this sermon came out crossways, but you got to listen to what I'm saying. There's three types of storms in the Bible. Three types of storms. Sometimes we think that everybody should just feel good all the time. Well, you should feel, I believe in feeling good, but if you're not doing good, you shouldn't feel good. In other words, if you're in sin, you shouldn't feel good. Right? And what happens is, it, especially spiritual sins, like unforgiveness, if you're in unforgiveness, you should not feel good. And if you feel rotten, maybe that's a good sign. That's really a good thing, right? Because what happens is eventually you're going to get into a storm. Everybody say storm. Eventually, you're going to be in a storm. And then you're going to pray, because I've had this happen to me. Then you're going to pray, and you're going to say, God, get me out of this storm. And God's going to say, here's the best I can do in this situation. And that's a real thing. When, Paul, when the angel came to Paul and said, Paul, here's the best I can do in this situation. I can save you. I can save everybody on the, boat, on, on the ship, but I can't save the ship. You say, why is that? I don't know why. I don't know why. But I just know that if there was no disobedience at the beginning, you wouldn't have been in this mess the way it is. And so God comes and delivers a message of hope God comes and delivers a message of joy. God comes and delivers a message of deliverance. See, Paul said, my conscience, the testimony of my conscience is clear. Basically, he's saying, I, 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 I have a clear conscience. Therefore, because I have a clear conscience, God delivers me, has delivered me, is delivered me, and will deliver me. Because my conscience is clear. In other words, I'm not acting in such a way as to act my way into a storm. Amen. So if you're, if you're going through a storm, a lot of times, you know, we automatically say it's the devil. Well, I think in most cases it is the devil. Because I think the devil is crazy. But it can be a Jonah situation. There's something God wants you to do, and you're going the wrong way. It can be a disobedience thing. That's the cause of the storm. And I know that this is a dangerous message because it seems like people's tendency is to always look down on themselves, second-guess themselves condemn themselves. They, that's their tendency to do that. And so they immediately switch that on and say, well, yeah, it's me. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm a sinner. I, I did it. But it's not necessarily that. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit re will reveal the cause of the storm. So let's, let's bow our heads just for a minute and just ask God right now, Lord, what are you saying to me in this what are you saying to me in this message? Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me in this message? What are you saying to me? 
Because God is always going to deliver the best verdict in a situation. The best verdict. Because God cares about you. He cares about me. He cares about the direction of our lives. He cares about what we are experiencing. And he wants to deliver us out of our situation. He wants to heal our hearts. He wants to bring healing to our bodies. Here's a big one. He wants to bring healings to our relationships. He wants to get rid of the wedge between husband and wife. He wants to heal the breach between parents and children. It's serious stuff when you think about it. Because you don't want to go into a storm. So Holy Spirit, we just pray right now. We ask you to help us. Reveal to us. We believe, we believe you have only good in mind for us. Only good. A good destination, a good life, good healthy relationships. You have only good in store for us. So Lord, if we are wayward, Lord, let me pray personally. Lord, if I'm wayward, God, I just pray, Lord, that you make it clear to me. Say that, pray that prayer. Just say, Lord, if I'm wayward, Lord, make it clear to me. Say it again. Lord, if I'm wayward, let make it clear to me. If there is anything in me, Lord, that is, you don't, is unapproved, Lord. I just pray, God, that you put your finger on it this morning and let it be, let it be revealed. Holy Spirit, you're the helper. The Holy Spirit knows what to do. Just say that out loud. Holy Spirit, you know what to do. Show me what to do. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, God. Hallelujah. There's a difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction is a healthy thing. Condemnation is so unhealthy. It, it, it causes shame and excessive guilt. Don't automatically think that what the, the storm you're in is something you did. Don't automatically think that. It's not necessarily true. But if there's something that you can see that this is, this is something I, I shouldn't be involved in, then you need to repent and make it right with people. Amen. Praise God. Let forgiveness flow in your hearts. Don't sin your way into a storm. Amen. Praise God. Well, I'm going to ask the prayer counselor, we usually sing a song, but it's getting late. I'm going to ask the prayer counselors, please, to come forward. Praise God. And uh, we're going to give you the opportunity to be prayed for. We have some good fellowship in the back and some treats for you to partake of. But let me, if this sermon resonated with you, let me encourage you to, um, let me encourage you to, uh, to make, to, to act, to act upon it. Don't just, um, don't just brush it off. Say, well, Pastor Steve, must have been having a bad day this week. He must have been at McDonald's eating. You got something you want to say? Okay. What's the announcement? Oh, 
parents, uh, they want you to go pick your kids up after church. I guess, I guess a few have stayed for, for a few days and <laughs> trying to get them picked up. I guess they've been here since last week and we're trying to, we're tired of leaving the heat on for them and feeding them. Amen. Well, it's been good to be with you. I hope you, next week there'll be a, a fire, uh, a fiery, encouraging sermon. But just think about the three storms, okay? All right, well, if you need prayer, please come forward. Join us for fellowship. God bless you all. You're free to go. Have a great week.